Praxeology, as Mises understands it, is supposed to be uh, an a priori science, and it's and insofar as economics is founded on praxeology, economics is supposed to be a, a an a priori science. And Mises often suggests that social science generally is uh, a priori. In fact, in one of his early works in methodology, uh, Epistemological Problems of Economics, Mises, before he developed the term praxeology, he didn't actually invent the word, but anyway, before he decided to use it, uh, he actually used the word sociology to mean something like what he would later mean by praxeology. Um, but he saw that was probably not a good idea uh, in switch. So um, now it's an interesting question. Uh, to what extent, you know, what social sciences other than economics does he have in mind as uh, being a priori? It's an interesting question. Um, at any rate, Mises always said, uh, yeah, maybe I should send more of these back. Uh, um, if when they get ended up in the back, or they just someone can put them on a chair in the back or something like that, I can direct people to them when they come in. <clears throat> Mises always said that he didn't take himself to be an innovator here. He didn't think that he was coming up with the idea of making social science a priori. He thought he was simply making explicit what had been the traditional method of uh, the social sciences, when he looked, or particular of economics. When he looked at the early economists, even though they didn't say anything in particular about a priorism, most of them, uh, the actual method they followed, he thought, was an a priori method, and so uh, he thought he was simply making explicit what was uh, what was already uh, implicit. However, there was also uh, a uh, arising in the 19th century a different approach to method, which eventually would give rise to logical positivism. Before there was logical positivism, there was just positivism. They didn't call themselves illogical positivists, they, uh, <laughs> but. What was positivism and what's its connection with logical positivism? Well, positivism was developed by a guy named Auguste Comte. Uh, he's the bad Comte. Charles Comte is the good Comte. Auguste Comte is the bad Comte. Um, uh, they actually at one time were sort of part of the same circle, um, but then, you know, one went to, the, one, uh, one gang of people went to the dark side and the other one didn't or didn't as much. Um, everyone goes to the dark side a little bit at some point. Um, so the term positivism was invented by Kant. He also invented the term sociology. Um, he also invented the term altruism. So he was, he was good at inventing words. Um, what he really meant by positivism is perhaps best understood by thinking about his, uh, his conception of the history of thought. He thought that the history of human thought goes through three stages. First is the theological stage, the stage where people believe in gods and spirits and souls and so forth. And he thinks that as people get more scientific, they get past that, and then you get to the second stage, the metaphysical stage, where they believe in essences and uh, and things like that. And then finally they get to the positive stage, where they get rid of all that old superstitious stuff, and they just believe in, in hard scientific fact. So he took the natural sciences as the model for all of, uh, for all of thought, and he thought that, you know, in essence, philosophy should either be guided by or be replaced by uh, natural science and you know, engineering expertise. In fact, his ideal vision of the future was a society where technocrats would uh, run everything. Uh, so the basic idea of natural science is the model focusing on, on you know, hard scientific fact understood empirically, uh, suspicion of theology and metaphysics. That's what positivism came to mean. <clears throat> and so... Uh, that's where logical positivism gets its uh, uh, gets its the positivism part of its name, although they didn't necessarily sign on to all the details of uh, Kant's theory, which could get quite strange at some points. Um, not that logical positivism doesn't get strange, but uh, you know, I think Kant's version of positivism may get in some ways stranger. Um, uh, he wanted a positivist church, a church devoted to science. Um, well, anyway, so uh, logical positivism arises uh, with the Vienna Circle. Uh, you've heard uh, you know, at least one lecture and maybe more, depending on what you've been to. Uh, the uh, you know, the leader, at least the best candidate for the leader of uh, 
of the Vienna Circle was Moritz Schlick. If you attended uh, David Gordon's lecture on epistemological problems of economics, you know what fate befell Schlick. Um, uh, <laughs> otherwise, well, you'll just have to look it up. Uh, I mentioned Hempel here in the handout because he was one of the positivists who was most interested in applying logical positivism to uh, social science and to history as well. Um, well, uh, the uh, the central idea of logical positivism is what's known as verificationism, or in particular the verificationist theory of meaning. And I will explain this theory the way it was first explained to me in the first philosophy course I ever took in college, from Roderick Firth. Uh, yes, my first philosophy professor was named Roderick. Uh, so it was a kind of line of succession. Uh, so here's how he explained it. He said, suppose a logical positivist meets a druid. And the druid says, the kind of thing the druids are prone to say, there are spirits in the trees. And the logical positivist says, what do you mean by that? Why do you say that? And the druid says, well, haven't you noticed that in the fall, the leaves turn beautiful colors and they all drop off. In the spring, new green leaves come out. Clearly, there are spirits in the trees. And the logical positivist says, oh, now I understand. When you say there are spirits in the trees, what you mean is, in the fall, the leaves turn pretty colors and drop off, and in spring, new green leaves come out. Oh, that's what you mean by there are spirits in the trees. I agree. It's sort of an odd way of putting it, but sure. Oh, I sign on. Sign me up. I'm a druid. And the druid says, no, no, no. I don't mean that there being spirits in the trees just is those things happening. Uh, you know, I mean that there being spirits in the trees is what lies behind what we observe and explains it. And logical positive says, Behind it? Oh, I looked behind the tree. I didn't see anything. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, so, the idea was that the, the logical positivist thinks that in order for something to be meaningful, it has to somehow be interpreted in terms of our ability to observe something. Uh, and so, you know, for example, the claim that there are atoms has to somehow be cashed out in terms of, since we can't perceive atoms directly, um, actually there's some doubt about that, but... Uh, if you think you can't perceive atoms directly, then you have to think that talk about atoms has to be translated into talk about the various experiments we do that make us think there are atoms. So the slogan that the positivists used was that bad pen, no, good pen. The meaning of a sentence is its method of verification. And he said, look, if you don't have any way of verifying something, you don't have any way of saying you know, how it is you know it's true, then um, then it's not clear that you're meaning anything at all. I mean, I could say there's a gazlonk in this room. You say, what's that? Well, you know, uh, you know, I have to be able to somehow cash it out in terms of something we could uh, have some kind of epistemic access to. So what a sentence means is determined by the means of verifying it. Now, if it's an analytic sentence, that is one that's a tautology, one that's true by definition, then the method of verifying it is, well, you know, just look and see, you know, is the predicate contained in the subject? If so, fine. But if it's a synthetic sentence, that is, if it's one that says something, you know, makes some positive statement about the world, then what the sentence means is determined by the method of verifying it, which is empirical. It's by doing some sort of observation or experiment. So when we talk about things that we can observe, then the meaning of the sentences about them is simply, you know, to say there's a table here is to say something like, if you come into the room and look in this direction, you'll see a table. That's you know, Something like that is ultimately what there being a table here means. When we're talking about unobservables, either like atoms or things in the distant past, uh, well, they, the, ver the verifications disagree with each other about how to handle things in the distant past. Like, for example, does Julius Caesar's assassination count as observable? It's not observable by us now, but it was observable at the time. Um, the logical positivists didn't always agree on how to handle those things. Um, at any rate, something there's no way of observing is just meaningless. Uh, they thought that there was, uh, if you couldn't observe it either directly or get evidence for it, then they thought that it was, uh, it was meaningless. Now, this ran them into a few problems. You know, for example, take the claim that there's life after death, or take the claim that you will survive your death. Is that claim verifiable or not? Well, if you do survive your death, then the claim is, ver is verifiable. You'll, it's testable. You'll find out. If there's an afterlife, you'll find out. 
But if there isn't one, you'll never find out. Which means that it's, it's being testable seems to depend on its being true, which is awkward if you think that uh, it has to be testable in order to be meaningful. So this is one of the problems that they um, uh, ran into. Um, at any rate, they they saw the point of scientific statements as being about prediction. Remember I said that to say there's a table in here is to say that if you come in here, you'll see a table. That is you know, what it means. It's you basically cashed out in terms of prediction. In the case of unobservables, like claims about atoms, ultimately this amounts to claims like if you perform such and such an experiment, then uh, it will, uh, you know, then you'll have such and such a result. That's ultimately what theoretical statements mean. Theoretical statements ultimately get cashed out in terms of predictions. It's the predictions that matter. Now, as Professor Hoppe mentioned, uh, Karl Popper was sort of on the on the fringes of this group. Um, so he's considered a, a semi-positivist. Um, one way in which he's different from the positivists is he didn't treat testability as a criterion of meaning. Unlike the positivists, he didn't think that uh, a statement had to be testable in order to be meaningful. However, he did think that the statement had to be testable in order to be scientific. So he was interested in sort of the demarcation problem. How do you create a demarcation between science and things that are not scientific? And for him, testability was the crucial difference. He's also famous for thinking that the relevant kind of testifiability is falsifiability. It means it's awfully difficult to prove things true, but you can also often prove things uh, false. But that particular epicycle in his theory didn't concern us. Toward the end of his life, he broadened the conception of falsifiability toward criticizability, which uh, improves the theory uh, quite a bit. Well, so what do we make about this verificationist theory of meaning? Well, I think there's a grain of truth to it. Um, but, you know, as is often the case in philosophy, you know, lots of false views in philosophy are the result of taking some grain of truth and then trying to build it up into you know, something much greater than it merits. The grain of truth is uh, something that Wittgenstein and Ayn Rand both agree on. And if you can get them both to agree on something, and the odds are it's uh, something crazy. No, <laughs> the odds are it's something worth looking at. Um, they both suggested that the ability to apply a concept is part of having the concept. If you, have a, if you claim that you've got a concept, but you've got no way of applying it, it casts doubt on your claim that you've actually got it. So, for example, uh, if I claim I have the concept dog, but in practice I can't tell dogs from tigers, I can't tell dogs from tables, you know, what exactly is this so-called concept of dog I have if I have no way to apply it? And so, it seems as though the ability to apply it is part of having the concept. It doesn't mean you're, you know, in order to have the concept of dog, you don't have to be sort of perfectly infallible at identifying dogs. You can make mistakes, but you have to be reasonably reliable in order to count. And it was Wittgenstein saying that that actually gave the positivists the idea of this. Like the, the positivists thought they got this from Wittgenstein. Because he said something that sounded kind of like this, but he didn't mean anything as rigid or as narrow uh, as this. He just meant that the ability to apply a concept is part of having it. But uh, that's not the same thing as saying that... Uh, um, that the meaning of, of something is just nothing but a description of how you would verify it. Now, uh, something that uh, we see a lot about in philosophy is something that's called the analytic-synthetic dichotomy. Uh, the terms analytic and synthetic come from Kant, although philosophers before Kant had talked in, essentially about this distinction. And I mentioned it before, an analytic statement is one where well, Kant's way of defining it is it's one where the, the predicate is the contained in the subject. So if I say um, uh, bachelors are all unmarried, this is going to count as an analytic sentence because the concept of unmarried, of being unmarried, is contained in the concept bachelor. So it is, this doesn't give you any new information. It's just, um, uh, it just repeats... Uh, information that's already... If you grasp the concept of bachelor, that already tells you bachelors are all unmarried. Whereas a synthetic statement is one that, that puts together the concept with a new, a different concept. That's why it synthesizes them together. It tells you something new. So, for example, bachelors are all under 10 feet tall. That's something you can't tell whether it's true or false just by looking at the concept. 
um, of bachelor. You have to actually go out and look in the world and see if you know, any bachelors are taller than 10 feet tall. Um, so, uh, you know, so that's a, a standard distinction. Uh, there are various philosophers who reject the whole distinction, but, uh, but anyway, the, uh, uh, the positivists certainly bought into it. Moreover, the positivists thought that these claims can only be known empirically, and therefore they can only be known a priori. Sorry, a posteriori. So, a priori means on the basis of what is prior, namely prior to experience, and a posteriori means on the basis of what is posterior, that is posterior to experience. In other words, something that's a priori is something that you can know without having to go out and test it. Um, so, the claim that bachelors are all unmarried is a priori. You don't have to go and interview bachelors to find out which ones are unmarried. But the positivists thought that, that all synthetic statements are empirical, they're a posteriori. You don't, can't know them into, into posterior to having, uh, having done some kind of empirical investigation. Uh, and the, the positivists thought that analytic statements are all a priori, synthetic statements are all a posteriori. Um, whereas, Immanuel Kant, the guy who introduced this terminology, thought that some statements are synthetic but a priori. Uh, and for example, he thought that mathematical statements, like um, 2 plus 7 equals 9, I just want to use examples different from... Philosophers always use either 2 plus 2 equals 4 or uh, 5 plus 7 equals 12. I want to use something different. Um, <laughs> Kant thought that this was synthetic a priori. Now, the positives thought it was analytic. Uh, the positives thought this was just true by definition. Um, Kant didn't think so. Why not? Well, Kant thought, if you think this is true by definition, by definition of what? You know, two, it's, not, it's, not that nine, it's not that nine is defined as two plus seven, because uh, if 9 were defined as 2 plus 7, then it couldn't also be defined as 3 plus 6. And so if this were 2 by definition, then 3 plus 6 equals 9 wouldn't be. So what's the definition? Kant thought that this isn't 2 by definition. This is, this is something where uh, we can... It's a conceptual truth. You can just, by looking at the concepts, you can see that it has to be true. But it's not true by definition. It's not that the, um, the predicate is, is contained inside the subject. The positives, by contrast, thought that this was analytic... And they were, um, no, but, they, but they agreed that it had to be complicatedly analytic. And of course, there was this big project at the um, uh, in the uh, early 20th century philosophy that people like Bertrand Russell and Wittgenstein for a while were involved in, and Frege were, were trying to derive mathematics from logic. In some sense, come up with some basic definitions and somehow prove that all of mathematics could be derived merely by logic. Um, but it didn't quite work. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm not sure what Goodall's contribution to it was. Uh, I don't know that much about Goodall. Um, the real way this came to grief is that it turns out that um, in order to do this, you need you need set theory. And it turns out that there are some assumptions of set theory that it's not clear or even true or coherent. But in any case, if they are true, they don't seem to be provable. Uh, logically, Russell found this. You know, this uh, Russell initially thought that you can just simply you know, did any description uh, just define a set? You know, so if I say, you know, red squares, I can never just define a set of all the things that have red squares. And so corresponding to any description, there's a, a set of things that define that, that meet that description. It turned out awkwardly that that's not true because take the description sets that are not members of themselves. Um, and it's not clear... It, you get a paradox if you try to assume that either that that set is a member of itself or that it isn't a member of itself. And so it seems that you can't have a well-defined set of things that aren't members of themselves, which means that there isn't automatically a set corresponding to every description. And so then how do we know which which uh, descriptions allow us to define sets and which ones don't? Suddenly everything went into, into chaos. And uh, Russell, having written with, with Whitehead, having written this this book where he spends you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages finally proving that one plus one equals two and so forth, and the whole the whole project uh, fell apart. Um, Wittgenstein had been interested in this initially. In fact, he'd gotten into philosophy as a result of reading some of Russell's early work on this. But later on, Wittgenstein thought the whole thing was crap, and Wittgenstein famously said, you want a definition of two? 
you know, Russell spends 300 pages trying to find two. I'll define two for you. One, two. <laughs> That's my definition. Is it perfectly good? Yes. Can it be misinterpreted? Sure. So can Russell's. It's just as good as Russell's. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so, um, now interestingly, when, uh, when Mises talks about uh, the truths of praxeology, he sometimes calls them synthetic a priori, but there's some of his early writings where he calls them analytic. Um, most Austrians have sort of focused on the synthetic a priori stuff. Um, some people thought, well, maybe it's the action axiom of synthetic a priori, because that's an actual proof that something exists. And maybe some of the other things, like action always involves the application of means to ends, maybe that's just analytic and not synthetic a priori. Anyway, there's a dis dispute about uh, how to take some of that. Uh, Wittgenstein tends to think that the analytic synthetic distinction, while it corresponds to something, is a little more problematic than it looks, because he thinks that uh, some that, that the ability since the ability to apply a concept is presupposed in having it, the, and the ability to apply a concept may depend on certain empirical facts being true, there may be some concepts you can't even use unless certain empirical facts are true. In which case, those empirical facts, you know, if there are the pre if some conceptual truths have empirical presuppositions, are those empirical presuppositions conceptual truths themselves now, or what? Um, and so, Wittgenstein tended to think that the analytic synthetic distinction was sort of the, was an overly simplistic way of, of uh, looking at it. But anyway, that would take us a little too far afield to talk about all that. So, I'm going to erase all this and talk about the conflict between positivism, historicism, and what Mises is doing. So, Mises sees himself as being in a situation where there's a fight between two groups, each of which is right about something and wrong about something, which is often how, you know, how thinkers in philosophy see themselves. As if you look through the history of philosophy, you'll find thinkers constantly describing his existing situation as, oh, we've got these two camps, and this one's right about X but wrong about Y, and this one's right about Y and wrong about X, and I'm going to come along and fix everything. It's a it's sort of a frequent move in philosophy. And often it's right. Often there are people correctly identifying the situation. So, uh, what do historicists and positivists disagree about? Well, the historicists were methodological dualists. They thought that you needed two different methods, one for the natural sciences and the other for the social sciences. In particular, they thought that in doing social science, you have to understand human action by sort of empathetically placing yourself in the position of the person who's acting and seeing, thing, seeing the world from the standpoint of their beliefs and desires. And this standard became known as Verstehen, which is just the German word for understanding or to understand. Um, but it, it came to acquire a kind of a technical term. So the historicists used this, this concept of Verstehen to mean this idea that um, in, in explaining human action, you have to explain it from the standpoint of the beliefs and desires of, of, the, of the person, where they didn't just mean, as the positivists would have, well, you posit beliefs and desires as some sort of theoretical entities explaining things. No, you have to somehow put yourselves in their shoes and see things from their point of view. Uh, whereas you don't do that in the natural sciences. In order to explain you know, why, the, why the ball rolls down the inclined plane, you don't have to put yourself in the position of the ball and, and see how, you know, how uh, natural it would, it would feel to just roll down that plane. Now, I remember the philosopher Spinoza once said that if a rock that you throw through the air could become conscious, it would think it was flying through the air of its own free will. Which also was dubious. Because if you pick up a person and throw them through the air, they don't generally think that they're flying through the air of their own free will. So I don't know why the rock would be uh, confused about this. But anyway, uh, so the, um, the historicists believed in Feshtayen, uh, whereas the positivists thought, no, you simply apply the methods of the natural empirical sciences to the social sciences too. So on that point, this methodological dualist point, Mises is on the side of the historicists against the positivists. However, on another point, it's exactly the reverse. Namely, the positivists thought that there were strict laws in social science. Of course, they thought that you find these laws empirically. You... Um, uh, you know, you do empirical research to find out uh, you know, what the laws are, but they believe that in the, in the 
on the possibility of finding strict laws, whereas the historicists generally didn't. They thought, no, no because uh, what people do depends on their subjective understanding of the world, and so people's subjective understanding of the world differs from one culture to another, and one era to another, and so you shouldn't expect to find universal laws in social science. On the contrary, you would expect that cultures that are different from ours, where people have different subjective understandings of the world, they will therefore lead them to act differently, and so there won't be any kind of universal laws in social science. Uh, so, uh, you know, the positivists you know, accepted universal laws, which Mises likes, but they rejected Tristan. The historicists accepted Tristan, but they rejected universal laws. Both, of, both groups rejected a priorism. What mistake are they making from Mises' point of view? Well, it turns out that Mises thinks there's actually two levels of methodological dualism. Not only is there a dualism between the methods of natural science and the methods of the social sciences, but there's also a distinction within social science. Uh, and he distinguishes uh, understand from conceiving. He doesn't usually use the German word uh, for conceiving, even though he uses the German word for understand. I won't inflict the German word for conceiving on you. There's one, though. Um, and there's a famous line from Mises saying, in economics, we must conceive, not merely understand. So what's he talking about? Well, uh, he thinks that he wants to distinguish between praxeology, which is the study of conceptual truths about human action that are a priori. We don't find them all through observation. These are facts like, like uh, action involves the application of means to ends, or uh, you know, we always apply the first uh, unit of a good we receive to our most urgent uh, use, or uh, uh, things like that. So basic principles of praxeology. Whereas these, this is our means of finding judgments about the contents of particular people's desires. So the way I find, you know, the way I know that, um, uh, the way I know that you, uh, you know, that you want, uh, you know, pizza rather than pancakes is not a priori. I have to actually observe your behavior. Uh, whereas the way I figure out that that action involves the application of means to ends is a priori. So there are two aspects of social science. And the pure theory is, uh, is going to be a priori. But then there's the application of it to particular cases. And this involves, uh, in his early writings he called it psychology, but then he decided psychology was actually sort of multiply ambiguous. And so, as someone mentioned, I forget who mentioned this, um, I think it was, it was Joe Salerno mentioned in one of his lectures that whenever, um, whenever Mises had a, you know, had found something he didn't quite have a word for, he'd make one up. So, uh, he was into the term themology, which comes from, uh, the Greek word tumos, meaning, uh, spirit, although it really means spirit in the sense of spiritedness or aggressiveness or self-assertiveness, which isn't quite what Mises had in mind, but, Anyway, it was just a way of finding a word that meant something like psychology, but where psychology wasn't already taken. And uh, this is the method by which we find out people's motives. So this is distinguished from praxeology, because it's not a priori. It uses the method of Fichtean. But it's also distinguished from what Mises called naturalistic psychology. And that's why he didn't want to use psychology for this, because he says, well, psychology is, is ambiguous. People have used psychology for all three of these things. This concerns those aspects of of human action that we can study without you know without doing either anything a priori or using Fichtean. So things having to do with you know your reflexes or your neurons firing or sort of the purely physiological side of human action that we can study empirically without doing Fichtean. The aspects of human action where in order to study them I have to sort of enter empathetically into your point of view to understand what you're doing. You could call that empirical if you want. It's a kind. Of, it's, it's not a priori. It's a kind of. Um, you know, it's based on observation of a kind, but it's based on observation where I have to uh, try to see things from your point of view. It's not the kind where I simply sort of do testing and so forth. So basically, uh, the um, the positivists, in effect, treated all uh, study of human actions as though it were it followed the methods of this. And the historicists said, "Now wait a second. There's this. Is what's crucial." And Mises says, well, yeah, both those things exist, but 
there's this that neither the positives nor the historicists recognize. Now, in order to apply praxeology, you always need themology. That's to say, it's uh, you know, it's a it's a, a praxeological fact. You know, the monetary theory is a priori. It's a monetary theory, um, but it's not an a priori fact that any given society uses money, or it's not an a priori fact which things in the society are money. In order to find out whether a society uses money, and if so, which which items count as money in that society, you have to go and look. So that's not a priori. Is it empirical? Well, it's empirical in a broad, the broad sense that you have to observe. But it's not empirical in this sense, because Mises says, look, if you just say, and Hayek uses the same example too, if you just see people trading little bits of paper or metal back and forth, you don't know whether they're buying or selling or rewarding each other or punishing each other or engaging in a religious ritual or what. If you, you can't just study the physical properties of the things that people pass back and forth, uh, and the fact that physically, you know, suppose I come along, take a piece of metal, and I give it to you. Am I engaging in an economic transaction? Or am I giving, giving you a reward? Or am I handing you a letter that I've scribbled on this metal thing? You have to use the fair stay in. You have to enter into people's subjective mindsets in order to figure out what it is that I'm doing. Um, and so, uh, you know, you need both this and this. Mises thinks you don't really, for, for the kind of stuff he's interested in, he thinks you don't really need much of this at all. Um, but you need both of these things. These things to grasp the abstract nature of action and these things to be able to apply it. But he thinks that the problem with the historian, of this historicist is that they were doing something that involved applying praxeological categories but they didn't recognize the existence of praxeological categories. Now it's true that the contents of people's desires vary from one culture to another, but the... Um, but the, the logical structure of action, he thought, uh, does not. Now Hayek, in his early writings, in particular in um, in his essays, The Facts of the Social Sciences and Scientism in the Study of Society, and uh, I've uh, mentioned both of those at the top of the pages, uh, a couple of uh, essays by Hayek that are worth looking at. Um, there's dispute as to you know, how praxeological Hayek was, but I think those two essays are fairly praxeological. And those essays, he argues, and I think this could be taken as arguing that, that these things are analytic rather than synthetic a priori, um, but at any rate, Hayek argues that the reason that praxeology works is that the items of the social sciences are defined in terms of human attitudes toward them. Money is not defined as green paper or round metal, is defined as a medium of exchange. And to call something a medium of exchange is to say something about people's attitudes toward it. And so, of course, from the fact that something is money, it logically follows that people in that society, or that you know, a sufficient number of people in that society are going to have certain attitudes toward it. So you know, Hayek seems to think that they're perhaps analytic, but he doesn't, as Mises sometimes talks as though they're analytic. But anyway, he doesn't think that they're analytic in the sense of being boring, useless tautologies. He seems to think that they are... Um, important. Now, there's a famous article by Hayek called Economics and Knowledge, uh, which has caused some controversy about how to interpret the similarities and differences between Hayek and Mises on this point. Um, Hayek wrote this, this is called Economics and Knowledge. He was criticizing neoclassicals, but he also took himself to be criticizing Mises, although he didn't do it explicitly. He was a little bit nervous about criticizing Mises. Um, but he intended his argument to apply to Mises too. What he said was, look, you know, we can't understand everything in the economy just by applying what Hayek calls the pure logic of choice. Uh, we need empirical propositions, and in particular he thought we need empirical propositions about how people learn, you know, how people learn from their mistakes, for example. After all, we know the price system is a feedback mechanism, but what if we were incapable of learning from feedback? Then how, good would the, how much good would the price system do us? So we need some information about how people are capable of learning from feedback uh, in order to know how to apply price theory. So he wrote this, and he handed it to Mises with some trepidation, thinking that you know, Mises was going to dislike it. And Mises said, oh, this is great, I love this, great. And Hayek thought, all right, so either he's misunderstanding the piece or I'm misunderstanding him. And... There's been dispute in Austrian circles ever since. You know, according to, there's one interpretation according to which neither side misunderstood the other. Mises was just being polite. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation is that uh, 
Mises did misunderstand the piece. He didn't realize Hayek was criticizing him. Uh, a third interpretation is that Mises understood the piece perfectly well, but agreed with it because Mises had never claimed that all the, all these things are a priori. He claimed that the abstract theory was a priori, but he hadn't claimed that the application of it was a priori, and so he didn't really have any disagreement with Hayek. A fourth interpretation is that uh, Mises certainly agreed that you need these propositions about how human beings learn in order to um, to apply praxeology, but that he thought those propositions were a priori, and he didn't realize that Hayek thought that they were empirical. So we got you know, those are four different interpretations out there of what happened. Um, you know, I'm not inclined to plump for any one of them over another. I'm just sort of mentioning those as uh, out there. Uh, Israel Kirzner has tried to develop an interpretation of Mises according to which at least some aspects of how human beings learn are, are a priori or are built into the concept of action. Uh, that's Kirzner's way of trying to handle this, this case. Okay, another issue I want to talk about is the distinction between impositionism and reflectionism. And I won't write those on the board because they're on the handout. These are terms that are introduced into uh, this uh, discussion by Barry Smith, who wrote a book called Austrian Philosophy, which is uh, worth a look. It's, um, it, uh, it tries to deal with the ideas of Mises and Menger within the context of uh, broader Austrian philosophy. And impositionism and reflectionism are two different views about the status of praxeological truth. Uh, impositionism is the view that what guarantees the reliability of praxeology is the fact that praxeology is built into the structure of our minds so that we will necessarily interpret uh, all experience in terms of those categories. Uh, we're incapable of experiencing uh, reality except through these categories. Um, this is this is a view that's often attributed to Mises, although there's controversy as to whether it's correctly uh, attributed to Mises. An analogous view is also often attributed to Kant, though again there's dispute about whether that's the right interpretation of Kant as well. Uh, Bertrand Russell once uh, compared Kant as he understood him to the idea that everyone's wearing blue spectacles they can never get off. So of course we're guaranteed to see nothing but blue because we've got these blue spectacles welded to our heads. Uh, it's not necessarily the most charitable way of trying to explain Kant's view, um, but uh, Russell was not a man brimming over with uh, interpretive charity. Uh, at any rate, uh, an impositionism will be the idea that that what guarantees the uh, reliability of these categories is that our mind somehow imposes them on experience, and Mises has often thought to hold this view. Reflectionism is the view that, on the contrary, uh, these logical categories are you know, out there in reality and that our mind picks them up from reality. Uh, Rothbard took himself to disagree with Mises on this point. Again, there's controversy as to whether that's the right way of reading Mises, but uh, Rothbard thought the difference between him and Mises was that Mises was a Kantian, and Rothbard thought that, uh, at any rate, that being a Kantian meant you impose these categories on experience. Um, Whereas Rothbard took himself to be an Aristotelian and thought the Aristotelian view was that uh, we learn these through experience, but not experience in the, you know, in the in the sense of the kind of thing we get through empirical testing. He thought we get them from experience in a very broad way. They're just part of the ordinary human condition, so they're not the kind of thing you would need to test in a laboratory. They're not empirical in that sense. They're empirical in the sense, same sense that the fact that there are physical objects around us is is empirical. Um, you know, that's not something you could test in a laboratory because, you know, testing in a laboratory presupposes that the stuff in the laboratory is real. Uh, it's just sort of a very broad uh, philosophical uh, fact. Um, and then there's a uh, uh, dispute over which of those is the right attitude to take or whether, you know, there's a third possibility. Now this gets us into something called polylogism, which is a position that Mises spends the first... Uh, a, a fair bit of the first hundred pages of, of human action attacking. Because uh, the first hundred pages of human action are sort of the, the core of the method, methodological part, and a lot of the methodological part is devoted to attacking polylogism, which is the view that there are different logics for different groups. You know, so you might think it's, it's sort of like historicism applied to logic. Different cultures, different eras use different logics. And, uh, and Mises thought that, 
this view was motivated by a hostility to economics. Yeah, Mises always thinks that any, any bad philosophical view is motivated by hostility to economics. Um, we thought, you know, so for example, there were some Marxists, I don't think that, I'm not inclined to think that, this, that Marx himself held this view, but there were some Marxists who talked as though, you know, there's bourgeois logic and proletarian logic, and maybe your arguments against the possibility of central planning work according to bourgeois logic, but according to our proletarian logic, you know, then, you know your logic is no good. Uh, and some of the Nazis pushed sort of racialized versions of this theory. Okay, well, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's Jewish logic and there's Aryan logic, and maybe these arguments apply work in Jewish logic, but they don't work in Aryan logic, and so on. And so uh, Mises thought that he needed to... Uh, uh, combat this theory. But of course, there are two ways of understanding uh, polylogism. You could simply have it as a descriptive view. The different groups use different logics uh, without thinking that necessarily they're all equally right. You might think, well, there's one group that has the right logic and all the other groups are wrong. Or you could you know, actually be a normative polylogist and think not only are there all logics, but all equally, you know, equally valid. Now, I think that Mises needs to combat both of them for his project to work, because uh, even if you just said that, you know, this is one logic that's right, but, you know, there are other people who use the wrong logic, well, the problem is if, if there are people who, who reason, you know, in a, f in a way that's fundamentally illogical or operates according to a different logic, it's not clear that economic principles would apply to them, you know. So, for example, if you think that being logical is simply a norm, you know, you ought to be logical, but you think that people might not be, well then, then you might think that the, the principle of marginal utility just says that you, you rationally ought to apply your first unit of a good to your most urgent need. But then that would open up the possibility that there might be some people, weird, illogical people, who apply the first unit of a good they get to their fourth most urgent need. And of course then you wouldn't be able to apply you know, the principle of marginal utility to explain their actions. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now Mises is going to say that it doesn't make any sense. He doesn't just want to say that it would be illogical in some, you know, in some sense that we would criticize them for doing this. He's going to say it doesn't make any sense to say that they're doing that. Uh, they, you know, it w doesn't, it was, just wouldn't count as their most urgent need if they, you know, if they applied their first unit of good to something else. You know, treating it as their most urgent need means that you just apply your, the first unit of a good to it. So he wants to reject, uh, normative polylogism as well. But here's a worry you might have. Suppose impositionism is right. Then the only reason that we experience uh, reality praxeologically is because our mind imposes this structure on the world. But then doesn't that mean that you know, there's nothing inherently, you know, nothing inherent in reality that has that structure? Different minds might impose a different structure. So don't, aren't you perhaps opening the door to polylogism by just thinking of logic as something that that the structure of a particular kind of mind imposes on the world. Now Mises, in fact, raises the possibility, could there be people out there whose structures of mind are different? He just says, well, maybe there could be, but we would never, we could never know it, or we could never communicate with them, and so forth, and so we don't have to worry about it. Or maybe reality looks different to people with different kinds of minds, but we just can't know that. But there, you might worry he's opening the door to, um, to polylogism. On the other hand, if you're a reflectionist, and you think that, that we get our logical categories from experience, then you might think that that means that logical categories aren't inherent in the mind. And so therefore, in principle, if experience imposed something different, the, mind's, the mind could be differently logical. So you might worry that either reflectionism or impositionism runs the risk of uh, polylogism. Uh, and so this brings me to uh, uh, something I've been working on in my in my own work as a way of trying to uh, uh, solve this problem uh, by talking about some of the work of Frege and Wittgenstein. For those of you who were at my Friedman talk yesterday, uh, you know a little bit about Frege. Um, if you weren't, then then you are in a sad and sorry case. Um, but Frege was worried not about polylogism, but about something similar, psychologism, which is the tendency to treat uh, logical laws as though they were psychological. So that, for example, you know, take, take a claim like, you know, from if P then Q and P, Q logically follows. It's a logical principle. 
uh, modus ponens, if you like it in Latin, if you like it in Klingon. Um, uh, but if you're, but for, according to psychologism, uh, to say that if P then Q and P logically entail Q, if logic is simply a description of how the human mind works, then this is going to mean something like the human mind, upon thinking if P then Q and P, has a tendency to pass to Q. So it's sort of a causal description of how the mind works. Um, and then, of course, if that's what logic is, well, you know, it's going to be fallible because the mind doesn't, you know, people's minds don't always, you know, don't always draw Q when they think these things. They sort of don't notice that it follows or something like that. Also, it would imply, again, that minds with different kinds of structures might think differently. And so, um, uh, uh, Frege, uh, uh, sets out to, um, uh, attack it. And his argument is it confuses laws of truth with laws of holding true. Uh, there might be psychological laws about if I hold that this is true and I hold that that is true, what do I tend next to hold as true? But he says logic isn't about that. It's about, it's supposed to be about truth itself. It's supposed to be about the fact that if this is true and this is true, then this follows out in reality. Um, and uh, not just a uh, description of what's going on in our minds. And the way he put it, and what's interesting is that Rothbard uses very similar terminology. So even though, as far as I know, Rothbard didn't read Frege, there's some question, by the way, as to whether Mises might have read Frege. We know that Mises read Husserl on psychologism, and Husserl was influenced by Frege. So uh, Mises might ha- might have been influenced by Frege indirectly. Um, uh, but uh, at any rate, um, uh, what... Um, uh, Frege says is that it's not a um, that it's not a physics of thought; it's a physics of truth, you might say, uh, or physics of being, and an ethics of thought. In other words, logic describes the way reality has to be, and then logic tells us how we have how our minds have to be how we have to work in order to match reality. Well, that's fine as far as it goes, but of course it raises, raises the question: Could there be unethical thought? That is to say, could there be thought that fails to satisfy the, the principles of logic? And if so, Mises might still be uh, in trouble. This is one reason I'm interested in uh, Wittgenstein, because Wittgenstein tried to develop a conception of logic that didn't make logic a constraint that mind imposes on the world, but also didn't make it a constraint that the world imposes on our minds, because he thought. Either of those opens up the possibility that the world would be illogical but for our minds, or our minds would be illogical but for the world. And he thought we couldn't make sense of an illogical world. We also couldn't make sense of an illogical mind. I mean, not in the sense. Of course, there's a sense in which we can talk about people having illogical minds. But he meant we couldn't make sense of something as being thought at all if it didn't have some kind of minimal tendency to follow uh, the laws of logic. In the same way that Mises would say, of course, people can make mistakes in their actions, if you apply you know, your, you know, the first unit of a good to your ninth most urgent want, that's not a mistake. That just we can't even make sense of that as being uh, action at all. What's interesting is that in, in trying to develop his conception of logic, Wittgenstein keeps using economic examples. Now Wittgenstein wasn't wasn't doing philosophy of economics. He was doing philosophy of logic and philosophy of language. But he keeps using these economic examples, and I think they tend to sort of illustrate the Cesian principles. He gives this famous example of this group called the wood sellers, who, uh, who sell wood by the amount of, or they do something that is interpreted as selling wood, by the amount of space that the pile takes up on the ground, without concern for the height. You know, so if you've got a pile of wood to sell, they'll measure the space it takes up on the ground, and, you know, they, and they say that, you know, the, uh, piles of wood that take up a lot of space in the ground uh, cost more, and others cost less. And of course, it'd be pretty easy to systematically exploit these people. You, um, you know, you buy a tall, narrow stack from them. You rearrange it so it's broad, and you sell it back to them. And you can do this over and over. Um, are these people, you know, so? And you know, you might think they just haven't noticed this, but when you point it out to them, they they're unmoved by it. They say, "Well, yeah, of course it costs more now because it's spread out." Are are they behaving illogically? Wittgenstein asks. We might want to ask: Are they behaving in a way that violates economic law? And Wittgenstein's answer is: Our only basis for calling what they're doing buying and selling has to be 
what they actually do in practice. From the fact that they say they're buying and selling, well, our only way to interpret what their words mean is how, how they behave in practice. So we can't, um, you know, we can't just go by the fact that their word for buying and selling sounds like ours. If they depart sufficiently from what we would consider buying and selling, we don't even have grounds for calling it buying and selling anymore. And therefore, we don't have grounds for calling it buying and selling irrationally. You know, instead, it could be like a religious ritual or something. I mean, this particular behavior of stacking wood and then you know, passing over, over little bits of paper or metal, depending on how the wood is stacked, there's nothing illogical about that activity unless you insist on simultaneously interpreting it as a sale and yet interpreting it as violating economic law. And so, you know, of course, Wittgenstein isn't trying to prove the economic point. He then goes on to say, likewise, if someone seems to be inferring in a way that seems completely illogical and not responsive to logic at all, what is your ground for calling it inferring? How can you even call it inference unless it somehow minimally meets uh, standards of logic? Uh, and uh, thus, um, Wittgenstein allows a way where we can rule out uh, not just normative, but descriptive polylogism. We can say that we can't coherently describe someone as behaving in accordance with a logic radically different from our own, because our whole ability to call something thought depends on us following the, the laws that we use as definitive of thought. If they're not doing that, then we simply don't, we don't have grounds for calling it thinking illogically. Just as if you see people tossing a, a ball back and forth across a net, you can't say, boy, are they playing chess badly. Uh, there's no grounds for calling that play. If it deviates that much from, from chess, there's no grounds for calling that chess anymore at all. Okay, that was a lot to absorb, and we don't have much time for questions, but we've got some time, so questions? Yes? Um, well, reflectionists come in you know, lots of different flavors, because both Rothbard and Barry Smith are reflectionists, but Rothbard's sort of a broadly Aristotelian. Um, by the way, I... What time did I start? 10, 15. Okay, I just started, I was going by my, the, the clock, which is wrong, but my watch, but what I said actually fits my watch rather than the clock. Um, no, <laughs> it's, it's divine intervention. Um, uh, so Rothbard was an Aristotelian who had. I don't think he wrote in any detail about perception, but he um, he was certainly influenced by Ayn Rand. I don't know how much he would agree with her defense of the reliability of perception, but anyway, he seems to have kind of a broadly Aristotelian approach there. Um, Barry Smith doesn't seem to think, unlike Rothbard, he doesn't seem to think of the of our access to these facts as coming through sense perception. He seems to think it's coming through some kind of rational intuition. And so then the in problem of induction wouldn't come up in connection with this for him. But you know, reflection is a very broad category, just as impositionism is. You could have lots of different ways of applying it. Yes? I think that is true to some extent. I think that it's, um, for one thing, uh, yeah, scientific theories don't really rise, you know, stand or fall by a scientific test because a scientific test can never test the theory just all by itself. It tests a whole bunch of things simultaneously. Um, you know, so for example, if I think that, you know, if I if I want to test the claim that water boils at 100 degrees, and so I get this stuff and I put it in a beaker and I boil it and I put stick the thermometer in, it says 90 degrees. Well, I know that something is wrong. I could be wrong that this that water boils at 100 degrees, or I could be wrong that this is water, or I could be wrong that it's boiling, it's bubbling, but it might be bubbling for some other reason, or I could be wrong in thinking I know how to read the temper the thermometer. So empirical tests, and I think there's a problem with Popper too. Empirical tests, you, know, you can never just falsify a whole thing by a simple empirical test. All the empirical test tells you is that something's wrong in your whole system, and then you have to make judgments of plausibility as to which things to accept and which ones to reject. And so you, there's a lot of sort of critical, rational thinking going on in science, not just empirical testing. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's an example that David Gordon gave in a previous lecture about how Galileo uh, disproved the claim that, that uh, heavier objects fall faster than lighter ones. The famous story is he went to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and dropped them. But what he actually did was a thought experiment. He said, well, look, if a heavy object falls faster than a light one, well, heavy object and a light one together count as an even heavier object. And so the theory predicts that because they're together they're an even heavier object, the whole thing should fall faster. And yet because they're two separate objects, you know, they should both fall slower, one more slowly than the other, and so the theory has inconsistent predictions. So, you know, so the history of science isn't just a matter of, you know, you know, sheer empirical testing. There's a lot, and, you know, a lot of the stuff Einstein did was sort of, um, was sort of, you know, Reasoning it out. Okay, I think we are out of time.